Hey everybody, Dr. Duncan here with an overview of food and its connections to climate change. One of the major problems humanity faces is food security. Having food security is the condition under which all or most of the people in a population have access to enough nutritious food such that they can live healthy and active lives. In the developing countries of the world, the problem is often just simply having access to enough food, and that creates problems in terms of caloric intake and not having enough or proper nutrition. We also have problems right here in the developed countries, such as the U.S. Many populations, um, such as the poor, have, don't have access to high-quality foods. They have plenty of access to enough calories, but they're not getting good nutrition. So what are the barriers to food security? Well, one of them is poverty. This is a problem globally and right here in the US. Around the world, the poor have limited access to enough food and enough food with good nutrition. This exacerbates diseases, delays or prevents proper growth in children, and can be a source of conflict in some regions. Even in famine situations, there's usually enough food to go around, but only those that have enough income can afford it. It's the poor that suffer the most during a famine. Meanwhile, here in the United States, there's an overabundance of food, but high quality nutritious food is often too expensive for the poor. You can spend $10 on vegetables and eat healthy for two meals, or you can spend $10 on high calorie, low nutrition food and eat for a week. Facing choices like this, many poor families choose the latter. This leads to health problems ranging from nutritional deficiencies to obesity, coronary heart disease, and diabetes. There are solutions to this and the other problems that are listed here. Did you know, for example, that right here in downtown Birmingham, there's the Jones Valley Urban Farm. It's a not-for-profit organization that is committed to growing crops and providing them to locals at low affordable prices. Birmingham Southern has had many students work and volunteer there over the years. Okay, moving on. Another barrier to food security is war. Agricultural areas can become unsafe to work in when there's conflict. Everything from tangling with combatants to combatants confiscating food. There can even be landmines planted in farm fields. War can also disrupt food supply chain, which hurts both the farmers and those who buy from them. The list goes on and on. Suffice it to say that war and hunger usually go hand in hand. Extreme weather events, such as droughts, have always been a problem, and now climate change is causing them to become more frequent. Rising temperatures are making some areas of the world difficult to grow crops in. Likewise, shifting rainfall patterns are having the same impact in many areas. This century, we'll see a lot of disruption to agricultural production due to climate change. Finally, there are the negative effects of industrialized food production. These range from the problems of unhealthy, overly processed foods to the concentration of pollutants, CAFOs, or concentrated animal feeding operations, are a particular problem because they concentrate pollution and also cause substantial greenhouse gas emissions. That's where most of your meat comes from that you eat if you are a carnivore. Agriculture emits about 25% of the world's greenhouse gas productions. And this is one of the major ways in which food and, agri and agriculture and climate change are all connected. Agriculture is also the leading cause of biodiversity loss, as you should remember from a previous class. <clears throat> greenhouse gas emissions are from many sources, including the fossil fuels to run farm equipment or to ship agricultural products. There are also emissions from livestock, especially ruminants such as cows and sheep. Even the creation of fertilizers consumes considerable amounts of fossil fuels and emits greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. In terms of biodiversity loss, the conversion of forests and grasslands to agricultural areas is the main driver of biodiversity loss globally. If we don't change how we produce food, this problem is going to worsen. Meanwhile, already we have significant degree of food insecurity. 
and we have to feed about 9.6 billion people by the year 2050. That's another 2 billion people on top of our current population here in the year 2020. Another connection between climate change and food production is already mentioned, which is that climate change is causing shifting patterns in rainfall and temperatures, which is causing reduced crop yields in many parts of the world, including here in the U.S. So given that we got all these issues and we need to feed a lot more people in the coming decades, what's going to happen if we produce much more food using current practices? Well, we'll see more excessive greenhouse gas emissions and we'll see more biodiversity loss. Do we have options? Absolutely. We can produce more food without worsening climate change and biodiversity loss. There are many solutions. They range from bioengineered crops that produce more food with less water and fertilizer, and they range to issues such as reducing food waste, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. We need to make it a goal to increase agricultural production without causing further harm to biodiversity in the ecosystems on which we rely. Your textbook has many detailed solutions. By changing our food production systems to be more sustainable and changing our food consumption habits, we can create all sorts of good results. These include mitigating climate change, that means reducing how bad climate change gets, reducing biodiversity loss, reducing air and water pollution, conserving soils, and reducing water use. This also will lead to increases in food security and improve our health by providing more food and more nutritious food to people that don't currently have enough of either. This is yet another example of a win-win-win situation. Moving towards sustainable food production is good for us personally, good for biodiversity, and good for the planet as a whole. Let's talk about food waste for a minute. One of the biggest issues with food and climate change is food waste. Food waste contributes about 8% of the total greenhouse gas emissions produced by humans each year. But at the same time, one third of food produced isn't consumed. This is a problem in developed countries as well as developing countries. In developed countries, uh, the problem is often just producing too much food that people don't consume. So think about every time you've ever been to a restaurant and the server brings you far more food than you can possibly or safely eat. A lot of that food, most of it, eh, all of it will wind up in the trash. That winds up in the landfill, and is, that usually winds up getting converted by microbes into methane, a potent greenhouse gas. So that's just one example of food wastage uh, here in the U.S. We also have issues of food spoilage, where we don't consume our food quickly enough, and it winds up going bad, and we wind up throwing it out. There are many other examples, but let's now take a look at the developing countries of the world. The biggest problem with uh, food wastage there is that a lot of uh, crop agricultural crop products wind up spoiling before they ever make it to market. So when taken all together, it's about uh, one out of one third of all the food produced on the planet doesn't get consumed. That's like when you buy three bags of grocery, you come home and you throw one immediately into the trash can. Obviously, that doesn't make sense. We shouldn't be doing this, especially since. Already, we have so many people that are food insecure on the planet. So what are the solutions? Well, there's lots of solutions that are listed in the textbook, but also the sections of the book Drawdown that we're reading associated with this unit. I'll point out that uh, reducing food waste is ranked the number third most effective way to address climate change by bringing down greenhouse gas emissions. So pay particular attention to that one. With a lot of climate change issues, our capacity to have an immediate positive impact is limited. For example, it would be hard for you to switch to a reliance on renewable energy right now. However, with food, we have an opportunity to do some good every time we take a bite. This is a website you will be using for a class assignment to help you assess 
how much different foods you eat contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. The goal of the assignment is twofold. First, to learn how different foods have different carbon footprints, and second, to empower you to choose your food more carefully so you can reduce your personal contribution to climate change. We will be using this website in class to calculate the carbon footprint of foods that we commonly eat here in the U.S. Feel free to explore some of the foods that you eat if you would like. Also in class, we'll use this fun quiz to test your knowledge of which of uh, different meals that are offered have the lower carbon footprint. We'll do the quiz together uh, in class. So if we haven't had the class yet, skip this now and come back to it later if you would like. If you have missed class or can't attend class, take the quiz and see how well you understand carbon footprints of the choices that are offered. You may want to do the readings first so that you can uh, do better on the quiz. At the end of the quiz, it offers some of these tips for having a low carbon diet. Some are easier to adopt as habits than others. For example, if you eat beef three times a week, you can cut back to once a week and substitute fish or chicken. That's fairly easy to do. It's harder for some of these other options, such as doing the research to find out if the fish or fruit that you buy has been air freighted. If you're inclined to adopt some of these habits, I suggest you treat them as guidelines to work towards, not hard and fast rules to adopt immediately. Gradually adopting these habits over time and figuring out which particular strategies work best for you is the way to go. If you tackle them all at once, you're likely to get frustrated and burn out. It's kind of like a lot of things in life. There are many other resources to help you learn how to enjoy a diverse and delicious diet and at the same time minimize your impact on biodiversity, ecosystems, natural resources, and the climate. One of those is Seafood Watch, a program out of the Monterey, Monterey Bay Aquarium in California. With the app, you can look up different types of seafood you find on a menu or at the store and find which ones are harvested in a way that is sustainable, or which ones to avoid because of over-harvesting those species or due to other negative environmental impacts. The app is free, and there are many other ways to have an opportunity to minimize your impact in ways that are good for you and good for the planet. There's a universe of information on the internet ready and waiting for you. Okay, that's a wrap. Your assigned readings and videos will provide more detail and context for these issues.